Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now today's video is the conclusion to my series Pistons and Rods and in today's video I'm going to tackle the valve spindles and the piston rods to leave me with all the components required for a final assembly. Now in this video you're going to see some screw cutting, you're going to see some turning theory and you already have seen a piece of my neighbour's tree. Now the reason I've got this here is it helps me illustrate a point that's going to uh, reoccur throughout this video and that is that when I'm machining something I normally start with some stock material and from it I make something more accurate. In today's video however you're going to see that the material I'm starting with is responsible for some of the finished geometry so that is to say that I'm starting with a piece of material and not all of it is being machined. So bear that in mind as I introduce you to the components. So here are today's components. I require two piston rods and two valve rods. Now in terms of design the piston screws on the end of the piston rod and is further retained by means of a locking nut and as for the valve rod the bobbin sits approximately here and is retained by two pairs of nuts that uh, allow it to move longitudinally and therefore provide some adjustment to the engine's valve timing. Now in terms of um, drawings, these are pretty much as Martin Evans drew them. I've made one alteration which was to remove the section of threads where it's not really required and when I get onto screw cutting I'll explain why I've done that and otherwise this is pretty much as Martin Evans drew it. Now I'm making these out of stainless steel and in terms of component geometry there's nothing really that challenging. We've got some plain diameters, threads and undercut grooves. That's it. There are however two main factors that I've had to put some thought into uh, when deciding to go about these and they are as follows. First of all as I uh, sort of described in my stick analogy I'm dealing here with stock material so this whole section of diameter and this whole section of diameter are left as stock material and that means that I've got to get my machining fully aligned to the stock diameter so in other words the center line that lies within this stock diameter has to align with the center line of the machining I'm going to do so I'll show you a few uh, techniques to get that right and also we have a fairly difficult diameter to length ratio particularly in the case of the valve rod they're um, quarter inch and the finished article is about six inches long. Now there are of course many methods by which you could go about making these and here come my two favourite. Number one would be the collet chuck you could for instance hold here and support with a tailstock turn all this then reverse the component in the spindle and finish off or you could try the Swiss turning method by which you turn this feature extend the workpiece in the spindle, turn this feature, extend the workpiece, turn this feature, extend the workpiece and so on until you have machined the whole component. The benefit of that method is that the material being worked on is never that far from where it's being supported and as you get further down you could always add a tailstock in as well. However there's a couple of downsides with the colic and they are as follows. Imagine I'm turning this piston rod and I'm holding it here now I can check that this material is running true but the rest of it is buried within the spindle and that could lead to the scenario where even if I have a relatively small error at this end there is an undetectable larger error and if you remember I mentioned the centre line of the machining needs to align with the centre line of the stock material that is one way in which it could go wrong so I can only check a little bit of the overall length and I might find I've actually got errors when I come through the finished assembly. Another error which is um, sort of most easily demonstrable through the Swiss turning method is that I'm holding on many different sections of the material and you end up with just about every feature being done in its own work holding operation. Even if you just go for the uh, two operation method where you do one and two, you are still holding the component on a different axis for both of those sets of features. And again, with this being stock material, if there are inaccuracies in here, then as I'm holding it, each feature is going in on a slightly different axis. So to overcome all this, I'm going to, as some of you may have guessed, do this between centers. Now, although that exposes the component to its maximum flexibility, 
it gives me the ability to do two things. First of all, it gives me the ability to have the whole material out on display so it can be checked with an indicator for all, all forms of error. And secondly, it gives me the ability to put all the features on the same axis. So once I've established my cone centers, all these features are going to be on the same axis because they're all being done between the centers. So step number one is going to be to put centers in the ends of all my bits of stainless steel and we will take it from there. Now this is an ER40 collet chuck and I actually did a video showing the installation of this chuck onto its back plate on this lathe and at the end of that video I put a question to the audience. The question was answered in the comments and I chose to act upon those comments and it's not obvious from looking at it but what I actually did was I removed the collet chuck again and I just turned the registration diameter of the back plate 0.1 of a mil for thou under size so that this whole chuck is actually slightly adjustable so what I've been doing to get these centers as true as possible is to set the workpiece in the collet and then slacken these three screws and just adjust the collet to get it running as good as I can and I can uh, demonstrate this with a clock this is a uh, 2 micron clock and the, the run out is about 5 microns, say 2 tenths of a thou. Okay, so that's all my cones produced. Now drilled cones such as these are perfectly adequate for most lathe work and indeed what I'm doing here. But just for the purposes of general knowledge and information, I'm going to demonstrate a process called cone lapping. By means of a dresser, I put a nice 60 degree point on there. And because this is stainless steel and a little bit sticky and not hard, I'm just going to charge the point with a little bit of grease. And it's much nicer to do this with your finger, but I can't really do that on camera, can I? And then I can lap the cones. I'm at the surface table now and I keep going on about these centre lines and this is where I'm going to conclude this topic. In an ideal world the centre line of the stock diameter and the centre line of the cones would lie on top of each other. Now in real life there's always going to be a mismatch both in terms of general alignment and radial run out and how well you can control the process will determine how close you get to this ideal scenario. Now the caveat to that is that all I can really do from a machining point of view is control how concentric the cone is to each end. What happens in the middle is down to the material and unless you're going to go into uh, trying to straighten stuff you're pretty much stuck with however the material is formed. So this is how I'm checking it and uh, basically I'm loading the component in between some centres and checking it with a tenth clock. So this indicator has divisions of a tenth of a thou, or for my metric viewers that's 2.54 microns. And to check this component I'm basically going to be finding the high spot, zeroing the dial, and then checking for radial run out. That's not bad, about two tenths. And then I'm going to move down the component at intervals and check both for the high spot, which tells me how uh, parallel this is to the table, but also the radial run out. It's creeping up there about half a thou. Slightly down there. You can see there's a little bit of error in this material down towards this end. A 
in about half a thou of cone again. Okay, so that's how I'm checking these parts. There's not a great deal I can do about it, as I said, unless I'm going to start trying to straighten them. But from here, I'll move on to some machining. So I spent a lot of time getting those cones right, and I did so because the alignments of this are fundamental to the component's operation. I'm going to get a bit of time back, however, though, because something that's not fundamental to the component's operation is the longitudinal positioning of all these start and end points. I reckon uh, you could get away with about 10 thou, quarter of a mil play in any of those dimensions and it not have any effect. So rather than come up with some complicated dataming system, I'm just going to mark them out with a height gauge. And the question arises, well, what face should I use to mark these out? Because the end face, of course, is just a uh, random face that I drilled into with the cone. So uh, to make this decision, I'm going to go into a bit more depth on how I'm going to machine these parts. We've got pairs of identical components, and I'm going to use what I've decided to call the twin dog method. So with pairs of components, I've made a pair of drive dogs. And for anyone who's familiar with turning between centres, hopefully the method has become clear. I put a drive dog on each of the components and that allows me then to interchange them in and out of the lathe very easily and accurately and so I can set the lathe up to machine a certain feature, swap the components, machine the next feature, set up again, machine it, swap them and by swapping these continually you almost get the second component for free because you've only had to map the features out once. Now you may have noticed but what is actually taking precedence there is the headstock cone. Wherever the headstock cone is, is going to be the datum for swapping these over and thusly for controlling the longitudinal positioning. So I'm going to take that method further and use that cone again for marking out. Now I've got a quarter inch diameter valve rod and a 5 16 diameter piston rod and I have made myself a quarter inch and 5 16 diameter point. This allows me to use the same cone that's going to be controlling by means of the headstock centre to do the marking out. And so I'm going to sit this on there to use my height gauge, but obviously this is a little bit unstable. So how can I address this? Well, in comes the V-block. Now, this is stainless steel and is not magnetic. This is mild steel and it is magnetic. So I can put this up to my magnetic V-block switch it on and I can now freely rotate the component resting on its cone to do my scribing without it sticking to anything. So I'm going to scribe out my lines and that will be my reference for turning. So the collet chuck is coming off and into the spindle nose is going a machinable centre. And I'm now going to take a little skim down the 60 degree cone just to ensure concentricity. And I'm just going to take the very tip off to ensure good clearances within it, any cone it may be supporting. And with some oil on a stone I will just tickle that up. Keep the stone moving at all times so it doesn't clog. So I'm just going to get on with this and I'll talk you through it as I go. First of all, I'll be putting a thread on the cut here and here in both components. Alignment of the cutting tool to the workpiece will be done by means of magnifying loop. 
swap the components remembering to get the drive dog on the forward side of the peg and produce the same cut again and reproduce the same cut again a quick clean up with brother's toothbrush and time for a tool change I'm taking out the grooving tool and in comes a 45 degree 45 degree tool with a little nose radius and I've ground this tool up such as it can do all the OD turning and chamfering required on all four components and I'm going to be turning the ODs to 0.247 and more on why I've selected that number later. And while I'm down here I'm also going to chamfer all those edges using the 45 degree portion of the tool. So I have now turned two thread undercut grooves and the thread OD on both components and I'm going to work my way down. Now on my next features I'm going to be about as unsupported as it gets, in other words I'm almost in the middle of the component and to help me I've brought in the addition of a steady. Now the methodology for this machining is going to be as follows. I've moved the steady rest up to approximately here and I'm going to turn the thread undercut groove and the thread OD. I will then advance the steady rest along the component further and I'll turn the next feature. I will then advance the steady rest again and turn the thread OD for here and I will then set the lathe up for screw cutting and I'll work my way back doing uh, this thread, this thread and finally this thread remembering of course this is on two components simultaneously. Now I'm going to leave this little end feature till very last because I don't want to reduce the diameter until I absolutely have to. Um, now the other option of course would be to put the steady rest here, turn the OD and screw cut uh, and that would save you having to set the steady rest up so many times. However on this lathe I have to go into back gear for screw cutting so I don't want to be swapping between screw cutting and normal turning modes too regularly. Steady reset and I'm now going to turn the centre sections out on both components. Well on this topic I said I would explain why I cut this section of threads out and the reason I did that is twofold. First of all it gives me a nice parallel diameter I can use with the steady but also it breaks this section of screw cutting up. If I didn't do this I would have to screw cut 2 and 11 sixteenths worth of quarter inch threads and by breaking it up I can tackle these as two much smaller screw cutting operations and it allows me to get the steady closer to where it's needed. In this type of turning I tend to take lighter cuts the closer I get to finish diameter which alleviates the need for lots of spring cuts at the end. I probably will give it a couple of spring cuts just to improve parallelism and surface finish but uh, so far it's looking okay. So I'm now going to turn the OD for this last thread and give myself a little bit of an undercut uh, just for now while I do the screw cutting. Okay I'm in back gear, I'm set for 40 threads per inch and I'm going to start screw cutting. Having taken the thread nearly to size, I'm just giving it a clean up ready to measure. I am checking this thread with the wires method and I've got about a thou and a half to come off the width over wires. With another thou and a spring cut, this thread has measured up nicely, so I have moved on to the second thread. Now when you're producing threads by means of taps and dies, 
the thread form you're actually producing is left entirely up to the manufacturer. When you're screw cutting however, particularly if you're grinding your own tools, the thread form you produce is up to you. And I need to just highlight one aspect of thread form that it's very important to understand when trying to achieve a good fit. So I've done some little drawings and it's over to the clipboard. When achieving a good thread fit you're really looking for the male and female flanks to match up nicely but it's important to realise that there should be clearance at both the crest and the root. And in this example clearance has been generated by using different size radii. So between the male and female thread one has a bigger radius, one has a smaller radius at the crest and it's in clearance. Now typically you'd produce this kind of thread either using a form tool insert or a tap and die. In screw cutting it's easier to use a flat to create the same example and here are a few pictorials of what that may look like. For instance we've got a sharp point versus a flat to give clearance, two different size flats or a mixture of two so a flat and a small radius and all these solutions give the same effect they allow the flanks to match up while leaving the crest and root in clearance now the quickest way to land yourself in a pickle screw cutting is to get the starting diameter wrong so this was a 0 0.250 thread quarter inch and i aimed slightly under that 0 0.247 that was to allow a small flat to appear once the thread depth reached its final position if I had started with a diameter that was too big, then when I got the flanks down to their correct size, the stock material would have allowed a point to be created, a point on this end, and that could lead to the disaster scenario where the, to get the two threads to fit, you've had to turn the flanks down that much that it's just the points in contact. That would be a disaster and that's something to avoid. Um, now. How do you know what size to turn this to? Well, you can either use a little bit of engineering now and say, well, the thread's however big, so I'm just going to knock it back a little bit. Or you can do it properly and turn to your machinery's handbook. And in here, if you find the right page, it will tell you for any given thread the max and minimum major diameter for your particular thread. Now, OK, these are UNS threads, but quarter 40, uh, it tells me that the major diameter can be anything between 0.2491 and 0.2440. I went for 0.247 just to um, aim for the middle. But that is a bit around thread fit and it's important to understand. Last thread now and the steady rest is taking a break for a moment. Thread's done, steady back on and I am regrouping at the tailstock end to finish this section of 3 16 diameter. Well that's it, valve spindles complete. So the valve rods are done, exhibit A, and I'm going to move on to the piston rods. Now the machining of these piston rods is nothing you haven't seen on here diameter undercut groove thread so I'm going to do them off camera. There is however one aspect of the setup that I want to illustrate. So here's a piston rod ready to go. Uh, when I come to machine it I will have a steady on there. I've got my drive dog set up. But I mentioned at the start of the video that by doing things between centres it gives you the ability to check the component, how it's sitting in the machine and to see if you've got any errors before you even start. So I've got this set between centres. I'm going to bring in the 2 micron clock. I'm going to bring it to zero and check the errors. So radial run out, I've got uh, 12 microns, half a thou. And I'm then going to check longitudinally its alignment. And that's within three quarters of a thou. And then I can also check at this end my radial run out and looking at about 20 microns. So the machining will by nature end up concentric to the line described between the two centres and I know that the stock errors are all within less than a thou so I shouldn't have any surprises when I come to final inspection and assembly. So I'm going to leave it there for today. 
There will be a video coming out called Pistons and Rods Finish Machining and in that video I will be assembling all the pieces, putting them back in the lathe and finishing things nicely. Now I do have to apologise for my log absence over the summer, it wasn't planned but things took their course, however I'm back in the workshop now for the winter season. If you do want more regular updates from me, follow me on Instagram, it's Mr underscore Crispin, I'm not in bad company on there, Stefan, Robin Renzetti, Abom and many others post regular updates on uh, all their various workings. Apart from that, I'll say I hope you enjoyed watching and see you on the next video.